welcome back to another episode of Cases from the Past. Today, I shall be covering the infamous Suffolk Strangler case. This case began in the town of Ipswich on the 2nd of December 2006. Gemma Adams had been missing since November the 15th. Her naked body was discovered in a brook just outside of town. Her body was badly decomposed and so her identity was not initially known. However, it was soon uncovered at the post-mortem. The discovery of a deceased female's body was big news in a county which had a significantly low murder rate. Only six to seven murders usually occur per year. Unexpectedly, just six days later, a second body was discovered in eerily similar circumstances. It was that of Tanya Nicholl, missing since October the 30th. An immediate connection was evident. Both women were sex workers and both were found naked, bodies discarded in water. Water proved a forensic nightmare. The killer was clearly aware of forensics and given the body placement, it was likely that the killer already had experience in the cold act of murder. Days after this body, and Lee Alderton's body was found, this time in a wooded area nearby a road. Had the killer altered his MO because of media coverage? Did he like the media attention? It seems plausible in my opinion. This victim appeared to be a change for the killer. Anne Lee was last seen on December the 3rd, 2006. Her body wasn't exposed to the elements for months like the previous two victims. This marked a turning point in the case. The body had been positioned in a crucifixion style pose. Luckily for detectives, the body wasn't in water and so forensic evidence was likely to be picked up. Tragically, two more women, Paula Clonell and Annette Nichols, were found deceased. The day was the 12th of December. Media had by now descended on the town as the case exploded in media attention. Shockingly, on the same afternoon that the world's media arrived, so did the discovery of the two missing women. A police helicopter that was taking video footage of the Clonell scene spotted a second body just 200 metres away. It was that of Annette Nichols. Annette had been posed, but Paula had seemingly been left as if the killer was in a hurry to leave the scene. The bodies were near to a main road. It was likely a quick deposition site for the killer. On December the 17th, 2006, a DNA profile was created. DNA found on the final three victims' bodies was matched to a man named Stephen Wright. The reason police had Wright's DNA in their database? Well, he had been arrested for theft of £80 back in 2001. Wright was now the main suspect and was apprehended on the 19th of December at his home and charged with all five murders. He later received life without parole in 2008. As mentioned earlier, Wright was likely already a killer. He had lived in the city of Norwich, 40 miles from Ipswich, for some time before moving to Ipswich. Steve Wright would often revisit Norwich, it had been reported. He had owned a pub in the red light district of the city back in 1988. Plus, he often frequented working girls in the town. He was even seen cross-dressing in the red light district, according to eyewitnesses. He would have had easy access to working girls and he would have had a level of trust with them. A potential victim named Michelle Bettles was supposed to meet a client in March 2002. She was seen on CCTV going in the exact opposite direction, however. Her body was later discovered. It painted a macabre similarity to the Ipswich case. She had been strangled and the body was found in a similar wooded area near to water. She had mentioned getting into a client's vehicle, according to a friend. The client was the cross-dresser. Could it have been right? Another potential victim named Victoria Hall was only 17 when she vanished on her way home from a nightclub in September 1999. Her body was found in a ditch just five days after her disappearance. She died by asphyxiation. It was reported that Wright's name came up as a suspect because of witness information. However, I haven't seen any more updates on this so I won't get into any more speculation at this time. So, 
What can we learn from this case from the past? Well, clearly, prostitution shall always remain a dangerous trade. Research in this case helped me to see a new perspective on working girls and how drugs are a root cause of women selling their bodies to fund addiction. Abuse is rarely talked about, and I feel that trying to tackle both drug and sexual abuse would help to prevent women falling victim to predators like Wright. Prostituting oneself isn't common if you're not suffering from some type of drug addiction or past trauma. The Stuffock Strangler case is just the tip of the iceberg for Wright and his crimes in my opinion. But with time, hopefully new victims can be resurfaced and families can gain some type of closure. Rest in peace to all of the victims. This has been another episode of Cases from the Past. Thank you for watching.